on Instagram. Write them ask in us, the comments. Ask us we, intellectual. Yeah, ask us intellectual. We'll write them in the comments and we'll make sure, uh, especially for the more medical ones, that we'll get an expert to answer your particular questions live. So make sure to write your questions early in the comments. She's all right. Um, because we'll be going through the questions, you know, as we get them. Um, none of these things is going to replace an in-person consultation or a teleconsultation with your dermatologist, but might be helpful, right? At least you kind of know the direction in which to go. Um, best facial wash, stuff like this I can answer because my, my mom actually doesn't answer product questions as much. She answers the medical stuff. Best facial wash, it really kind of depends what you need. One of the main things we've seen this year actually is over cleansing of the skin, which can affect the barrier layer of the skin, which is really important. So you want a facial wash that is gentle, Never use a bar soap on the face because it is way too basic, very, very high pH level. The pH of the skin is naturally a little bit more acidic. So you want a cream or a liquid cleanser uh, for oily skin. And you really only do want to be washing your face once, twice a day, maybe maximum three times if you also work out and something that's allergen free. So we have the Spring Fresh line in our super skincare line that has some great facial washes that are options. Okay, before anything else, um, again, we're sending powerful sort of healing and recovery vibes to our friends and fa family, pardon me, in the south of the Philippines, which got hammered by Superstorm Odette, internationally called Rai. And we have just gone live on our websites with donation options so that if while you're shopping at bmvhypoallergenics.com, or vmvhypoallergenics.ph, you want to purchase a small donation, we're going to be donating to Tanging, I forget all of a sudden what the organization is called, Red Cross, the Red Cross Red Crescent International Fund, and also, oh, there's a local fund that's also tied up with Ateneo, et cetera, et cetera, that will be donating to victims of the storm. So. Go ahead and check that out. Um, and yeah, please don't forget to like us on Facebook. You usually like doing yes, it. Yes, I do. Uh, don't forget to like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and well, subscribe to our YouTube channel and watch every uh, little video. Turn on the notification bell and say hello. Can you hear them? Nope. Is he mumbling? Probably. Let me know. <laughs> Like us on Facebook, follow, follow us on, on Instagram, Instagram, subscribe to our YouTube channel, watch every video, turn on the notification bell, and like every video. Oh, I love seeing old friends here on Facebook. Jenna, it's been forever. <laughs> it's been I'm here. Year for us. I hope you're well. Um, dry skin, getting cold and cold wet. Okay, I will write all these questions down and get to them. You're the first one with that question, Jenna, so we'll make sure that we get to that. <laughs> I can't can you see it. Push. That's you. That's you. It's okay. Can you see this? Hi. Here, so you. Hello. Okay. <laughs> Hello. Hold on. Let me let me move this a little bit. There you go. Okay. Are you there? I am here. Okay. Hi, everybody. So, uh, yeah. Why don't we start this off already with um, some of the more common skin issues that we have seen <laughs> all year. Okay, Gavin. Yeah. All right. Folks, I will preface this by saying if you are squeamish, this is a bit of a trigger warning. Some of these oh, yeah. photos are pretty intense. They're a little graphic. Uh, all identifying marks have been hidden. But, you know, these are some of the things that we actually saw. And the reason we're showing them to you is not because they were strange, but because they were surprisingly common in the year. Okay. I'm going to try sharing my screen now. Hold on. Hmm. Can't seem to find ah, screens in the morning. There we go. Let's see. Hopefully, there we go. Okay. So, folks on Facebook, Instagram folks will not be able to see this, unfortunately. But um, so some of the more common things that we've seen. Let me know on Facebook, guys, if you can see the screen share. Um, they can so see there. Can they even? See oh, that? actually, shoot! I didn't even. <laughs> This is how out of practice we are. Before anything else, let me introduce my mother properly. So Doctora, Dr. Baralio Rowell is a multi-published 200 plus plus clinical studies published in medical journals around the world, peer reviewed, 
um, an author of two medical books that are regularly cited. And she is an educator, so she teaches residents. She's an international lecturer, and she is huge into contact dermatitis, photocontact dermatitis, hyperpigmentation, psoriasis. And um, also my grandma. She's also <laughs> her grandmother. And mm. my so there, say hi to the Flora. Hello. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Can I uh, see your messages? Happy holidays to everybody. Okay, so I hope that you guys can see the share for those on Instagram Live. I well, I don't know. I can I can angle it to, for them to see the. Yeah, you want to try? Sure. Okay. So can you um, switch the like Tafara, camera? why don't you walk them? us through some of the more common skin concerns that you saw throughout the year? Um. So the first this one a, is the photo contact. I know. This is Logan that Laura likes that I really feel, feel covers the top uh, problems of the skin this year, the, in the past two years, actually. And that's called the Great Barrier Grief. All right? Did you hear that? Yes, I feel it. The Great so. Barrier Grief. I, it's fantastic because, uh, in fact, the top uh, skin problems of the years has really been because of the dysfunction of the skin barrier brought about by allergens, irritants, the sun, visible light, and uh, the overuse of chemicals that induce the irritation, the allergy, the photosensitivity, and uh, photo aging of the skin. Okay, so why don't we start with this? That way we can get the Instagram people back to normal. This is a case of photosensitivity. Mm -hmm. In a person who really likes being out in the sun, as you can see from the freckling of the skin. But what makes it more obvious now is that there's a great diffuse redness in the back of the neck where he was probably covered by a shirt. And so where he was covered properly, there is the skin is not bright red, whereas above that, it is bright red. And this is already to start with on photo age skin. Mind you, by the way, he has some pigmented marks there that should be followed through over time because some of those can become cancerous. you know cancerous okay this this to me is pretty cool because not a lot of people still talk about photo con uh, airborne contact dermatitis but it does really happen yeah uh, hold on. if you notice the so upper so eyelid is much more irritated much redder much more swollen than the lower eyelids and why is that in airborne photo allergy or airborne contact allergy, the, this, the chemical settles on the upper lids more. And so therefore, that's why she's much more irritable there. Much the same way for people without hairdos like mine or not long hair, they will have it as an irritation also on the side, on the back of the ears like that, and also on the sides of the neck. And in some people actually go and become acne over time. And it's not really regular acne. It's more an acne due to a fungus infection. Okay. So. That's very the, common nowadays. Yeah. This is why I think it's important to talk about airborne contact dermatitis. Is people think of, con of skin problems as just from what you apply on your skin. This is actually from stuff that's wafted up, like from bleaches that come up in the air. Correct. Maybe from candles and stuff. From room fresheners. Air Very fresheners. common. Right. Okay. Malasasia folliculitis. Yes. Um, a lot, some people now call it sweat acne, but uh, it's not really just from sweat. It's from the hair follicle as well, which becomes uh, a little bit more infected than the usual number of uh, microbes that are normally there because it's caused by a bacteria a by fungus. a fungus rather that is uh, a common uh, that is a native inheritor uh, um, resident of the follicle it's called malassezia it used to be called pterosporum and malassezia which i think is a prettier name is produces the folliculitis folliculitis being an inflammation of the hair follicle okay. that happens in people who perspire a lot and then um, I tend to get that. Right. <laughs> okay. Or use too many chemicals. So they, the bacteria kill, you know, we're using too many chemicals in laundry soap, for instance. And so the uh, microbiota of the skin right. is in imbalanced. It's imbalanced. The barrier is also the, this, this morphic. So that 
the fungus is able okay. to thrive. This is a superbug infection, folks. Um, and again, what we're seeing because of all of this disinfection and all of the bleaches and everything is the skin, it, the microbiome of the skin, which tends to keep us protected, is now a little off balance. So we're seeing some bugs that you wouldn't normally see that are some super bugs that are really quite dangerous. That's right. So if you see something that looks like a boil or a pimple that looks this angry, don't try to just treat it yourself. Go see somebody and get a culture. Okay. That's right. So Madison is just ah. going, yes, you will notice that this is really very inflamed. Mm -hmm. You see the spreading redness beyond. And then in the middle, you're getting to see all of those little punctate areas of the pus starting to come out like a volcano at different spouting areas. Yes. That is a super bug. And it's, uh, it's a common problem that we're getting to see so much so that there are articles coming out talking about the fact that we may have to deal with the superbugs menace later on, not just affecting us, but also involving our animals that eventually go into the water, that eventually go to the animals and go to the fish, to the pigs and to the, you know, to the beef and all that. So this is overuse of very strong chemicals at home, but especially in hospital situations, for instance, because of the worry about the COVID and the others. So, it has now come up with um, resistant organisms that are, we are calling superbugs because we have to use more than one or two or antibiotics, but uh, and choose the the ones that these bugs are still sensitive to in order to get rid of a pneumonia or we whatever. We can expound a little bit later. I want to get off the screen share uh, soon ah, okay. because it's a little hard for folks on Instagram to see. Right. So obesity and psoriasis. Oh my, yes. That has become a problem. Obesity has become a problem during these um, times because of people working from home a lot or uh, not, not going to school or doing their um, uh, more things at home. And so they people tend to not have very regular meals or eat a lot or snack a lot in between and they eat processed foods instead. So obesity has become a problem. This has been a, something that I've been uh, really paying attention to because I see a lot of patients with psoriasis and when they become obese, we have a problem of a what we call an, an, an underachieving or under responding to even the strong, the biologics that we are using now. So, so. skin and our overall health is really related. No? And mm -hmm. then I'll do finally on this. This is a form of folliculitis again. <laughs> it can be both. It can be bacterial, it can be fungal. So very often in cases like this, if it's recurring and the dermatologist or yourself has already used chemicals that are antibiotics in nature and they continue, it might be antifungal that you're needing, yeah. you know, so. Um, a dermatologist is normally do a scraping uh, to examine what kind of organism is there. Okay, so, and now, oops, sorry, <laughs> poor folks on Instagram, I hope you're still with us. That was sort of a funny way of trying to show um, some of the more common issues that we've dealt with mm -hmm. in the year. Um, and yeah, let us know. So, where was I? I really hope I, I couldn't see the screen. So I'm not quite sure if people could see what we were talking about. Um, <laughs> are you okay? I am okay. It's just that I have, I'm wearing this very holy dress. And so my poor bracelet found it exciting to get into today. But get that out. Um, okay. So I guess in summary, you know, she mentioned the Great Barrier Grief. What we're really seeing is that the skin's barrier uh, has been extremely harassed, damaged by all the necessary, right? We needed to do it necessary disinfection, hand washing, um, sanitation, bleaching, alcohol, all of this stuff has really upended has really harmed the skin's barrier layer. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing a lot of dryness, a lot of redness, a lot of cracks. And the problem when you have a disrupted barrier in the skin is it can develop cracks where it becomes opportunistic for other microbes to enter. So now you can have a secondary infection that you're dealing with, but also the barrier layer is where it plays an important part in the skin's microbiome, doesn't it? Microbiota. Oh, yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Why is that? Can you give us a rundown maybe? Um, the organisms are actually on the top layer of the skin as well as along and around the, uh, what we call the glands, you know, the hair follicles in particular. So what happens is that there is actually a gut and brain and skin connection so that when the brain, uh, when, the, when, the, when you're eating improperly, so that uh, microbes are kind of disrupted in, the, in their balance so that there are many more organisms therefore and toxins are produced. Mm -hmm. This can then be uh, gets into the bloodstream, gets into the skin and can destroy that barrier layer so that the barrier therefore becomes inefficient. But the barrier layer, layer itself is slightly acidic, right? And that's important for the bugs that live there. Right. The reason it's slightly acidic is because the fatty acids that, uh, that are derived from the oils that you eat and gets into the skin as well, um, it gets into the sebaceous gland and the sebum, you know, that's the oil that you're producing, comes out. And then as it comes out, there are microbes, both bacteria and fungus, that live there and they break down the, the, the lipids into fatty acids and the fatty acids being acidic will give it what's what, what we call the acid mantle of the skin. So, Another yeah. point, by the mm -hmm. way, is that in addition to all the chemicals that are in the air, producing airborne or that you touch producing irritant or allergic dermatitis, are the steroids, are the treatments that you may be able to buy on online that may be stronger than you think, that may have hidden steroids or actually a steroid cream that is available in some of these online stores. And the I see a lot of patients during this past two years who came with really severe steroid um, uh, dependency so that when they stop using the steroid, the skin breaks down and becomes irritable. And, you know, I just had a patient I discharged yesterday from the hospital who had a problem like that, that we had to sort of really, you know, help out during that withdrawal period from the steroids. Oh, aren't steroid drug, steroids drugs? Yes, oh, they're a drug, but somehow they're available. Okay, folks, so another be tip careful. here, don't be buying ste topical steroids online sort of willy-nilly. They are usually in most countries prescription drugs, so you should have someone should be asking you for your prescription from a doctor Correct. and you should be using your topical steroids not like a daily moisturizing cream you should just be using it according to the instructions of your doctor so getting to questions um so again for those of you who might have come in a little bit late we just did sort of a, a brief rundown of the most common things skin concerns that we saw in 2021 but this is an open forum. If you have any questions at all about your skin, definitely please ask them. We're getting a bunch on Facebook already that we'll get to. Um, and yeah, certainly on Instagram, just type your questions in the comments and we'll make sure to get to them. If there Jana, are no questions, may I interrupt? We have questions. Ah, okay. <laughs> Jana is back. Uh, oh, Jana. From Lisa, who we said we'd do a yes. paper on or uh, at least an, a blog post on the gut. Baltimore, right? right? Interaction, Utah. Utah, okay. So Jenna's asking tips for how to best take care of dry skin now that it's getting worse in cold weather wow, yeah. to keep on getting worse as winter progresses. Okay. My two very important things not to miss at all is really coconut oil and pure vas alba or petrolatum. The reason for that is I actually did a review of all of these uh, moisturizers and uh, you know, um, emollients for the skin during winter time. And uh, going through all of that, I have a review, Jana, because I know you're very interested in this kind of thing. I have two articles that are review articles, mine as well as uh, uh, somebody from Kaohsiung University in Taiwan, where they actually went through all of those oils and examined them one by one for their various uh, functions. And uh, we both found out that the coconut oil is amazing in that when you apply it first on the skin, because it's relatively thinner, the fact that it breaks down into its fatty acids and therefore is able to replace the fatty acids that are destroyed in the lipid bilayer of each cell we have in our body, including even those tiny little things that are inside our cytoplasms. 
you know, those fatty acids replace them. So they help rebuild, rebuild the barrier. That's one. And then in addition, it is also occlusive because it is in fact an oil. So when you apply it on the skin, it's able to run in between the, uh, we call it the brick and mortar uh, model of, the, of the, the, the skin barriers called the brick and mortar. And the mortar is the oil phase and the brick contains water phase humectants in them. That oil phase is very often damaged in what we were talking about earlier. And so in order for the oil to run down, you need to get a good humectant that can go in and keep the water in. Now, the importance of the petrolatum, the, vas the pure Vaseline, is that when you put it on top of the skin, it is so dense that it is a, it's a real occlusive is what we call it. So it's an occlusive, not much of a humectant. Okay, we the also oil have is live both. streams all about VCO. Sorry. <laughs> that really go into, this is super interesting. And I know you guys love hearing this. I just want to make sure that we get to all the questions. <laughs> Sorry. So short answer is she's a huge fan, Jenna, of virgin coconut oil, as you already know, in the winter. But what she really likes doing is layering for right. barrier repair and for dry skin. So she'll suggest maybe a moisturizer with BCO mm -hmm. and then pure virgin coconut oil on top of that. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, um, the pure Vas Alba, Petra Latum. And don't put it on the surface of the skin. After you do all of that, those layers, massage it, love your skin, massage it all the way in, let it go mm -hmm. in, it's fantastic. Um, other, can I add to that also some nice tips for the winter for dry skin? Try, even though it's freezing outside, not to shower in super hot water. Oh, absolutely not. As lukewarm as you can tolerate it. And as short as possible. And as short as possible. And then, as usual, avoid allergens and things like that. For Wonder Wonder Girl, who I saw on Instagram, yeah, we'll probably be posting an excerpt on this of this on IGTV after. Um, okay, Catherine, Michelle Alvarado. Okay, what do you recommend for syringoma? Oh, syringomas are tiny little tumors of the skin. They're benign, nothing to worry about. And they tend to be kind of inherited trait. Some, if you look around, some relatives of yours might also have those little tiny dot like spots that look like warts, except they're a little bit deeper. How to treat them? There are many ways of treating them. Depends upon your skin type. If your skin type is the kind that if we cauterize them, they don't, you know, they'll get a red spot and then they'll get a scab and then they fall off and you have no marks, no redness, or, you know, then that's the way to go. It's the cheapest and the simplest way of removing it's by cautery. If you're not, there are nice new laser treatments nowadays that can also target them. It may take two or three or even more times to, to uh, repeatedly but they do go away. Some of them are better now, so one treatment will take care of it. Uh, if I may, don't self-diagnose. Right, <laughs> make, be yeah. sure the diagnosis is correct. <laughs> one, of, one of our bigger tips for 2021. Hi, Madison. Hi, Maddie. My, older one, my daughter. Yes, I'm doing Gavin's gift. Uh, okay, go. My granddaughter. 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 <laughs> you um, think I had one too many. Okay. It's too early in the morning. It's too early over here. So, um, what did I just say? Where was I? Yes, don't self-diagnose. So what we're finding, you know what I thought was really interesting? And I actually wonder if you'd agree with this. So for me, for most of the history of skincare, while self-diagnosis has never been a good idea, through the majority of the history of skincare, it, it's been fairly straightforward. You could have done a little bit of research and gotten some fairly casual guidance and read a package and been okay for the most part. But what we're seeing in part accelerated by COVID mm -hmm. is because some of these skin conditions are so funky now and they're so unexpected, you really cannot be self-diagnosing. Like so many things she pointed out earlier in the in this when we were sharing slides, things that can look like a really bad boil, right? Or pimple can actually be a very serious superbug. Superbugs are those microbes that are very resistant to a lot of drugs. So they're quite dangerous, right? So self-diagnosis for me, at least at this time, I think is a little more dangerous than it might've been in the past. Yes, agreed. So, so even something like syringoma, don't 
don't go online and go, oh, I have syringoma. Try to get a proper diagnosis, okay? This is true. Many of the diseases that we, we before would look at and think immediately of something, we now have to really check and look very carefully because many of them are changing in the way they look, the way they appear, you know? So I, the truth is I do a lot of teleconsultation and we have a patient coordinator called Hannah. I love the girl. <laughs> she always instructs the patients on how to take awesome. pictures so that they're in the same angle like that and then to date it. So that from, from one, day one to day, what? 24, 28, 30, when they send back the pictures or follow up, I can really scrutinize the picture and see them very well. It's fantastic how skin lesions seem to change nowadays. And we have to make the proper diagnosis ourselves to be able to treat the patient properly. So there. So yes, yeah, syringoma relatively easy, but you do need a proper diagnosis. Jenna has, oh wait, hello to Jean. It's also another regular viewer. Welcome Hi, Jean. back from Laguna. So Jenna's asking another, I think this is actually really timely because we just spoke about superbugs. Are certain parts of the body more common or susceptible to having a superbug infection? Yes, the That's legs. Very commonly you get them in the legs, right? I was looking at a picture before I came in of a patient who I had seen four times already. And the very first time was really scabby and red and, and after taking so many antibiotics, but it was the wrong antibiotic because it's a superbug. So we had to do a culture, a proper culture, bacterial culture and sensitivity. I even did a fungal culture and sensitivity also. And I had the resident who was in, my, uh, in our clinic do the scraping so we could also do the fresh uh, examination of the fresh specimen. That way you can really identify what organism you're treating. The other thing I do is I actually have a, an infectious disease doctor or two that I reach out to ask them questions about what is best to add on or to use for a particular patient. I had one last night like oh, that. Yeah. But, so why you know. is it more common on the legs though? On the legs is because the superbugs, the organisms that are there tend to be gram negative organisms from the soil, from the dirt, from, you know, from whatever you've been cleaning down there. And so therefore the organisms are also becoming superbugs in the, in the, in the ground. You know, that's why the, m many of the things that are from down there are usually bad. Not only that, because of the blood vessels may not be functioning say, properly. Yeah. Also, there's a, there's huge veins and arteries and stuff down there. So, um, but also depending on where they are, there are certain aspects of the legs, not around the knees and stuff, where maybe there's not enough blood that, that flow. Um, and a patient last night who is living on a little island, a beautiful little island south of here, and couldn't come down because of the Christmas thing, and asked showed me a picture that worried me so much. I called the infectious disease doctor and between the two of us, we decided on giving two antibiotics with no culture, but based upon just experience and know how, what mm -hmm. organisms may be available from the water and then from the soil when he would get out into the island and all that. So, okay. Gave. So yeah, so Jana, that's the answer to that. Christina uh, Madara, how can you tell if it's eczema or contact or airborne dermatitis? Very difficult, even for me. Uh, so this is why I like having pictures mm -hmm. because the pictures are such a beautiful way of showing patients. It's amazing how I will tell the patient, do you notice how your upper eyelid is much more red or swollen and the lower eyelid is none? Then look further. Do you notice that it is more on the lateral but not on the inner, the inner eyelids are completely clear or the opposite. Do you see the opposite that it's really here? So this is the tear. There's something coming from your yeah. eye that you're dropping into the eye that is making, making the irritation down on the left side, a little bit in the upper like that. So yeah. It's uh, tough. Tough. <laughs> for, for, so here's the other thing, Christina. No? So eczema, atopic dermatitis. Mm -hmm. Eczema is kind of a blanket term. Right. Um, for something that is eczematous. So it has to develop these bubbles that then pop and crust over and get very itchy. Mm -hmm. So that's quite the typical. Th yeah, typical for let's say eczema, right? What's called atopic dermatitis. The thing is eczema, atopic dermatitis, these things don't live in a vacuum. 
they tend to be really cross-related to things like Correct. contact dermatitis. So that's why my mom, every time she has a patient with atopic dermatitis or psoriasis um, or rosacea for that matter, or even sometimes acne, she'll insist on a patch test because there's, there's so many triggers. Usually it's so common to have eczema and contact dermatitis at the same time. So that your eczema is actually fine, fine, fine. But if you use something with fragrance, if you are allergic to fragrance, it will now trigger a flare up of the eczema. You know what I mean? So it's, um, I guess my short contribution to, to this expert's input is it's hardly ever either or. It's hardly ever just eczema. A bit of this, a bit of that. Yeah, usually there's Maybe a, a bit of food. This. There's a lot of that. So there really has to be, yeah, seen. There you go. Christina's adding, my upper eyelids get red and inflamed sometimes. What happens in the up if it's upper eyelids? If it's upper see? eyelid and it's more in the inner and also down here, but not there, it's something coming from your eye, maybe eye drops that you're putting in there, for instance. But if it's on the upper lid, like here and here, it's probably really airborne. So you have to consider the sprays, the fresheners, what other people in your environment are using as perfumeries and all that, that's airborne. Or like I've had also in some patients who went back from Manila to the province to live with the parents because of COVID. And they now live in a big rambling, I mean, big uh, in a home where there's a large yard with lots of trees that are nice smelling like mangoes and, you know, mm -hmm. um, lemon and calamansi is what they call. Um, that Those are nice smelling, but then they're also airborne allergens. So those can, be, can get in the air and irritate that, irritate this, irritate these areas that are exposed. But why would it be more on the upper eyelids than say lower? Because it is, it catches it. Think about it, it keeps folding. So it goes up and down. There you go. So, um, so yeah, the, you know, and again, it's so funny to me, you know, because when people think about airborne contact, airborne dermatitis, airborne contact dermatitis, I think it's so hard for us to imagine that stuff that you don't touch that you mm -hmm. don't actually apply on your eyelids and your skin, that that can actually affect your skin, but it really, really can. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite cuentos when I was younger, stories when I was younger, is a good friend of mine who's an old patient of my mom's, who's hyper allergic to fragrance, <laughs> um, developed real redness here. And my mom kept going, what, what are you using? And she was like, I don't use anything. I've, I've been allergic to fragrance my whole life. I don't use anything with fragrance. And so much so that I put candles all around my house because I miss the smell. And she was like, oh, well, there you go. <laughs> airborne. It's here. So mm -hmm. yeah, airborne is really a thing. But yeah, I think the most important thing to say there, um, Christina, it, it's, it's hardly <laughs> ever either or. It's really usually like that. So it's good to at least see a derma, at least in the very beginning, to really accurately identify, get the patch test, and then you can manage it going forward already. Right. Sorry, you were about you were saying. I was something. about to say that um, the um, notice also if you've been getting sniffles more, you know, if you've been getting runny nose more, you may want to consider that that's also airborne allergen, okay. the same thing that's producing the rashes there. Okay, so um, trying to make uh, yes, okay. So Jean is asking best advice for skin whitening. Uh, and the healthiest way to whiten skin. I don't believe in whitening the skin beyond the natural color of your skin. Yeah. I truly believe that the color that you're born in is probably the best color that you're really going to and it's beautiful. Uh, maintain it. It's, it's beautiful. beautiful, right? Whether it's on the dark brown side or in the light brown side or white, yeah. they're all beautiful. But you so, have to know what are yeah. important in the caring of the skin so that the white skin remains white and not freckly and cancerous as you grow older. The brown skin doesn't become dark and pigmented and here and there because of irritations as you grow older, you know, etc. Okay, I'm going to add to this now, just to get past a little bit the semantics. Oh, then answering so, the whitening first. Yeah, so uh, you're what, what, here's the thing. To whiten skin isn't really a possibility unless you're talking about really bleaching, trying to change the color of the skin. What she and a lot of dermatologists will tend to prefer is to lighten it 
or to clear hyperpigmentation. That's there a whole different thing. That's a whole, right? that's a whole ball game. Right. That's, you know, like here, I have some spots here. I don't know if you can see, there's like a freckle there and it's covered by concealer, but I have hyperpigmentation now. Um, for that, there are a lot of options. Okay. Then people ask me about glutathione and the IV. Forget it. You know, when you do any of these antioxidants, remember, God made us balanced creatures and the oxidants in our body are both pro-oxidants and antioxidants. And there's even pre-oxidants, right? Those exist in the bodies as well as in the plants and animal kingdom. And those multivitamins and supplements you want to buy a lot of uh, are usually gotten from, um, from plant uh, origin. So if you take too much, you know, like the RDA says, take a thousand units of vitamin D, but you are so worried. So you decide to take five or 10 or 20,000 units without really checking how deficient you are, if you are at all deficient, you are imbalancing the body. And the worst kind is therefore the glutathione when it's injected by IV has been shown to have so many side effects that we've actually, our society as well, has already told the FDA. And the FDA has come out already with a pronouncement Morning. not yeah. to go into IV glutathione. So, so what is safe? Yeah. yeah. What is safe is you can use retinoic acid, especially in the face, people with hyperpigmentation due to some acne spots. Mm -hmm. It can take care of the acne and at the same time, it is able to go into the second layer of the skin, which is the corium, and it can normalize the uh, pigmentation changes that occur in the upper layers of the epidermis so that you can lighten the skin gradually, very nicely and gradually, but it is even and nice. And then if in addition to that, you layer the colorants that you use on your skin, like you want to use a what a background makeup and then a makeup itself and then the blush and all that. We've shown in our study that layering uh, can mm -hmm. actually help in protecting your skin from visible light. And the, before you, all of that layering though, you must really place a sunscreen which has iron oxide, yeah. okay. titanium and di dioxide and zinc oxide. So, okay, for those who are just joining us, we're taking questions. This is kind of an open forum. So ask your questions, we'll get them answered live and ask them quickly because we will run out of time. Um, in summary, Najin, to me, if trained by her, it all starts with prevention. Yeah. Hyperpigmentation is the most stubborn thing. So even if you use an extremely powerful drug and manage some level of, um, of getting rid of the hyperpigmentation, it will recur. It's just mm -hmm. so notoriously recurrent. So it's so important to practice prevention. And that means for the most part, she mentioned the sun and light screen something that has titanium dioxide, zinc oxide, iron oxides, and use it every single day, even indoors, even when you're just like using your phone and stuff like that, because visible light causes hyperpigmentation. And other forms of prevention, avoid photoallergens. When you're bleaching the house, chlorine, what's up? We were talking about airborne, right? It causes hyperpigmentation. Fragrance in anything causes hyperpigmentation dyes in makeup and stuff like that. So that's kind of really key, even before the treatment. And in terms of the treatment, there's so many effective ones. There's retinoic acid, kojic acid, all these things, but they will recur without the prevention. So right. that's really, really important. Prevent and protect. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Langit Glenn, good morning. Our daughter who has eczema had a teleconsultation yesterday and we forgot to ask, are there any foods that she needs to avoid? With food in eczema, especially in growing children who really need a lot of those good foods that people tell them not to eat, <laughs> I kind of prefer really treating your child like I started to do yesterday with topical treatments the way I explained to you. You know, this is a fantastic family, by the way. I love well, talking. we won't get into details here. because <laughs> I the love the little girl. I was, she was my patient yesterday. Well, anyway. With, with the parents <laughs> chiming in and telling me about the history and all that about the child. But the thing about it is that uh, with food, eat what you what is healthy. You know, milk. Uh, people stop milk, but do, are they really allergic to it? You know, and people will eat, for instance, a pancit and say that she's allergic to shrimp. 
well, you really don't know. Maybe it was allergic to the yellow dye of the of the noodles, or allergic to the betsin that the, this the restaurant was putting in, or they were allergic to the you know other spices that were there. So the, what I tell people is, uh, eat simply to the or, you know just. If you know that you're not allergic to a particular cereal or rice, let the child eat that and add shrimp. You know, don't make it in omelet. Don't, you know, just the shrimp that is um, um, fried or whatever, and then let the child eat that. And if with that very simple meal of the shrimp with the rice, the child doesn't break out, then you know that he's not allergic to it. And then at least you can have that already in the list as something. But I find that better than having the prick test, especially in a child with atopic dermatitis, where there are lots of skin uh, irritations anyway that hyperreact when they do the prick test in those areas. So better to clear up the skin first so it's no longer hyperreactive. And then eventually we can do a patch yeah. or a other, you know, so atopy patch test or whatever. Adding to that as well, I think one of the more common fallacies that we get, you know, from customers and patients is the belief that skin and food allergies are the same. It's actually quite rare for them to coincide, you know. Um, to test for skin allergy is a patch test. And to test for a food allergy is a whole different thing. And sometimes it's really complicated. Sometimes mm -hmm. you need a prick test and a blood test. Yeah. And even that's not decisive. You still have to do an elimination diet thing and blah, blah, blah. It's really quite complicated. But for the most part, um, skin allergies are T cell mediated, whereas food dust mites are B cell. Are B cell, yeah. They're, they involve antibodies and stuff. So they actually don't. They're circulating antibodies. And yeah. so the reaction to them is immediate. Right. That's why if you're allergic to a certain food within the hour, you should get an allergic reaction. That's a B cell reaction that the, that Laura was that I interrupted her oh, no, <laughs> when she was talking about it. Yeah. That's B cell. The yeah. T cell, which is the allergy to by contact, by airborne, whatever, that is um, with, with the patch test to that. Therefore, takes about five days because we do the patch. We wait for four, two days, and then yeah. another one or two days. But so yeah, I wouldn't obsess so much if you have a skin, if you have eczema, atopic dermatitis. I mean, obviously, if you also have an allergist because you have severe rhinitis or something mm -hmm. else, that's different. And then follow those instructions. But both doctors should work well together, right? Because things like asthma, there are certain drugs in asthma inhalers that can actually be acnegenic or cause hyperpigmentation or be steroids and, and affect the skin as well. So an allergist and a dermatologist need to work well together. Yeah. But something that's fairly straightforward, atopic dermatitis, I wouldn't obsess about the food so much, right? Um, a follow-up question from the same person is, I okay, so I use products already, but I still get pimples, especially a week before my period. And thank you for very interesting topics for today. Thank you. You're the one asking the question. So you're yeah. creating the topics. This, you know, another person asked me this on my personal Instagram, actually. How do I deal with hormonal acne, mm. pimples that come right before my period? Right. Um, before, what we call adolescent acne was the hormonal acne that was due to the changes in the body for you to become a man or, a, you know, a young lady or a young man. But now, what we call adult acne, which is anywhere from 22 to 25 onwards, is also very common. You are getting to see pimples in adults uh, like yourself uh, as much as we used to, to see in the teenage years. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the cause for the teenage acne is due to the stress of the hormones that are being hyperproduced. The stress is also hormonal in adult acne, but the stress is now produced by many other causes. It may be hormones actually, but it uh, because of your periods that's coming up, but it can also be, and you must be mindful about other stresses in your life, yeah. like the chemicals that you're exposed I to, like say. something you're doing at the at the office, mm -hmm. you know, like a construction going on, like you're not able to sleep well at yeah. night, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So remember what we said earlier. For those who've been here since the beginning of the live stream, we were talking about self-diagnosis is really kind of the most inaccurate thing now because mm -hmm. before, while it might have been fairly straightforward to say it's hormonal acne. Now, because of all the bugs thrown right. off balance by COVID and bleaching, it could be a whole host of things. It could be um, 
you know, a microbiome imbalance. So it's actually fungal, it's not bacterial. It could be a medical condition. Certainly that's something a dermatologist will want to rule out, mm -hmm. but it could also be other skin stressors. So your, your skin's kind of just going nuts, <laughs> or it could be a halogen sensitivity depending on where it is on the face, right? right. So again, I one console would, yeah, or two consoles. So at least get an idea about what's going on in your. Yeah. Okay, Vanessa, what can you recommend for oily skin? Love it. Oily skin is not bad. It's so good. <laughs> Congratulations. Oh, unless yes, it's really no, produced. It's unless you know, I, I, I recently had a, an older a patient, maybe younger than me, but she said, uh, what kind of powder should I use? Because I really am very oily. And I think, she said, thank God you're oily. You know, because you're shining and it's glowing. It looks terrific. Otherwise, it looks, you know, ordinary. As we age, but we, we, our skins produce less oil. Less but, oil than if you in fact are really greasy, very oily, so that it's producing problems and giving you difficulty in putting on makeup or giving you actual pimples, or that's a different thing. Then you have to treat the uh, seborrhea is what we call it, especially if you're also getting seborrheic dermatitis, mm -hmm. which is the scaly crusty yellowish kind of thing in the eyebrow, right. on the eyelids and giving you dandruff. That's different, that's treatable. Otherwise, it's, it's actually fairly easy to manage oily skin. Oily skin is actually quite healthy, I find, truly. Mm -hmm. I think we've gotten past the years of I think because we both have dry skin. But, I uh, grew up with oily skin. She never remembers. <laughs> that's true. That's, so true that's true. I had okay, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> ah, okay, and what was funny is I used to tell my friends, they'd be like, hey, your skin looks good. And I'd be like, isn't that funny? When I was younger, people were like, your skin's so oily. And then as I got older, it was glowy. I'm like, okay, whatever. But, it, you know, oily skin tends to wrinkle less prematurely. Oily right. skin has some great things going for it. But like she said, if it's really hyper greasy, yes. where you have seborrhea and all these other things involved, then what she would do, it's not the oil necessarily that's the bad thing. It like, might be all the these things other that things. Are, yeah, exactly. To deal with. Okay, Rhoda, after a few days of using topical steroids and and my facial psoriasis clears, mm. can pure petrolatum be used, then VCO on top? The oil goes first because it's thinner. So short answer, yes, but you reverse the order. Mm. Um, VCO first and then the petrolatum. And don't make it a habit, that steroid thing. Yeah, you really don't. Because do after a while, you begin to be... In the skin. Con, you know, you, you begin to go to it. And then before you know it, where now the steroid will clear it up in two or three days at the very most, or even one day, as you continue to use this, you'll find out it takes a week. And then later on, it's no longer... Tach tachyphylaxis is what <laughs> there it's you called. Go. <laughs> It becomes steroid dependent and then steroid resistant. And then it gets to be steroid thin skin. And then you come to me and I say, okay, we'll have to have steroid withdrawal now. <laughs> you know, a good guide folks, honestly, is topical steroids. If you need them more than what, twice a year, three times a year, then your management and prevention can be improved. If you're preventing well enough, and this is through allergen avoidance after a patch test, maybe some medical concerns, maybe there are other things to consider, stress management, lifestyle, proper nutrition, exercise, good sleep. You really shouldn't be having flare ups that much or maybe a biological for psoriasis. Yeah. But topical steroids more than a few times a year, unless it's a really exceptional case, most dermatologists will not be happy about because of this increasing dependency on it. And it, yeah. it can be quite dangerous, right? We did a live stream on topical steroids. It's, I should give you that cool. picture of this young man that I saw only the other day. 2019, he first came to see me, January. And now, 2021, right? He was very steroid dependent. He was thin, painful, depressed. This is a 17, 18 year old boy. You can imagine that age, you know? And highly discolored in all of the areas mm. that he had been irritated and allergic to. So there's 2019, January, December, 2021. The whole family is in the teleconsult say, thank you to me because of what we've done. They follow the patch test and all of that. And my resident and I, because I had residents from Akati Medical and another from Skin and Cancer, they were beautiful. They said, 
it's not just the doctor, it's really you and your family that you followed everything that the doctor had told exactly. you about changing the detergents and the laundry okay. and the this and the that. So that's fantastic. I'm going to rush us forward, folks, because we have maybe another just nine minutes left. So we'll be taking our last questions now. Um, okay. I'm going to jump ahead here. So Jean has two questions. Dry, how to help restore dry or damaged hair, hair ah, and tips beautiful. for falling hair, thinning hair. Oh, I'll go first with the thinning hair because it's so much more common nowadays. And then we'll go to the hair because that's a totally different kind of a subject. But the thinning hair is very, very common nowadays where all of a sudden you wake up in the morning and the hair is shedding. You know, the patient said, I got up and my hair stayed down, you know, uh, where normally the hairs are shed off like something like 10 to 15% of your hairs every day, you know, very little. So just a few and you don't hardly notice them. When you get what a condition we call telogen effluvium, uh, the, instead of just the num that number falling, as many as 50 to 60% of the hairs are, are falling out already. And this is because of a stress that you had a major stress that you had two to three months before. Yeah. And that triggered the hair roots to stop producing hair. And then two to three months later, the root now starts growing and, and pushes out the old uh, inutile kind of hairs that were just sitting there. The stilogen effluvium, they are, it's so common nowadays. You don't know how common it is. So, and okay. normally it's acute from a severe yeah. illness. But chronic telogen effluvium, I see quite often. So telogen effluvium, you'll you'll be more familiar with it from chemotherapy. Yeah. When the hair goes because of the shock to the system of the chemo, and then it grows back. Or pregnancy after giving birth, you have that temporary there you thinning go. of the hair, and it comes back. But what we're seeing now, because of the tremendous stress of the times, so much stress, so prolonged over two years of the pandemic, she's seeing a lot more of that. So yeah. the first thing is get that stress under control. And then stress isn't just mental or spiritual, it's also on the scalp. So mm -hmm. if you're using, I think Jean had mentioned she was using gentle, yeah, but also avoid fragrance, yeah. preservatives, right. dyes in your hair care, because all of that stress is the skin of the scalp. That's where that thing holds on to. So you don't want that either. Um, yeah, that's kind of the thing. And, and of course, VCO is wonderful for both scalp and Absolutely, hair. Absolutely, yes. You know? Oh yeah. Right. Oops. Okay. There. Okay. Sorry. Um, another. Oh, question. and then for the the other question was regarding the hair that is broken or, you know, well, uh, use the proper methods of uh, hair care. I mean, you know, if you're brushing your mm -hmm. hair too much or using rollers oh, or using with this 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 tight. Yeah, this oil. one. It's called ballerina baldness for a reason. I don't do this every day. I don't even do it every week. I don't even do it every month. Because the more you do this, the more you're stressing, you're pulling on the, the roots. We so actually have a name for it. It's called traction alopecia. alopecia. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot more stuff you can do for hair now, hair loss, and all these things. Christina is so nice. Oh, Christina, I'm such a fan. Always, um, I work in beauty and skincare and love you. Oh, wonderful. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, okay. I think actually on that note, because it is 25, minute 25, and I'm sure you have 3 million patients and, and This has been papers. wonderful. <laughs> this has been so, a yeah. great interaction with patients. Thank you so much to the audience for patient. asking us. You need a proper uh, consultation to get, don't, please don't take, this is medical <laughs> advice. You have to have a proper teleconsultation or consultation with a dermatologist, her or someone else. Um, yeah, oh, sorry, quick one from Rhoda. Prevent hyperpigmentation on the side of the face, especially cheekbones. I definitely would go back to avoid allergens and photoallergens. Use a sun and light screen every day. Layer. And if you're like me, I'm here. My window is here where I work. So my hyperpigmentation here is so much worse. So I put loads of sunscreen here, um, there. Okay, I think on that note, we'll have to say goodbye. <laughs> but have a great Christmas. Whatever you celebrate. And so, uh, uh, Hanukkah's our, done. Happy holidays. Go. Yeah, happy right. Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, uh, Christmas, happy holidays, wherever you are, whatever you celebrate. 
And, and happy new year. Happy new year. And stay safe and keep the questions coming. We'll, we'll answer them separately. Okay. Hi, mom. Bye-bye. Bye. That was fun. It was. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, um, just a quick reminder. I had mentioned, you know, earlier when we started that um, we have, oh, you're, thank you, Jean. That's so, I so appreciate that. So we have set up options on our websites to, yeah. um, so that when you shop, you can actually donate. You can top up to donate to certain causes. And we just put up a new page um, to, to donate to victims of the superstorm, the super typhoon, Rai Odette, um, and to all of our beloveds and, you know, brethren and loved ones and family and friends in Cebu and Bohol and Chagao and um, the other super affected areas in the South. We love you and, you know, we're going to do our best to support you. And, and before I go, I want to make sure I say to folks who have been messaging, you can find me, you can ask me stuff personally on, um, on my own Instagram at Laura at PNB, certainly also about PNB products and yeah, we, we are very aware that our stocks have been atrocious and I am personally very sorry about that. It's been really difficult in the pandemic. So in addition to being very sorry about that, please know we are so committed to getting back all our stocks and also that we so appreciate you because we're still here. <laughs> That's kind of a big thing after two years of a pandemic. So happy holidays, everybody. Be safe, take care of each other. And thank you for joining us today. Bye.